Welcome, everybody. I know more people are sort of streaming in to our webinar here tonight, um, but I'd like to, to welcome you. My name is Karen Lawrence. I'm the Assistant Director of Case Western Reserve University Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, um, and I'm excited to invite you back for another one of um, our lectures in this new series um, on Cleveland civics and Cleveland history um, that we are co-sponsoring with the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland and the Cleveland History Center. Um, so it's been really just interesting and exciting to, to learn about all of these different aspects of Cleveland history. Clearly, um, so many people have been signing up for these lectures too. So the plan is to continue um, these, these lectures into the future too. So, so thank you guys for all of your interest and for being here tonight with us. Um, before I introduce our speaker for the evening, I did just sort of wanna go over um, how this will work. I know a lot of you, this is old hat at this point, but in case this is your first um, webinar with us. We are not going to be able to see and hear you, um, but we still do want you to participate and to hear your questions and to hear your comments. Um, and so you can do this in one of two ways. There's a chat button on the bottom of your screen. You can type in any comments that you have there. Um, and then there's also a Q&A button where you can type your questions. Um, and it's actually a really nice feature I do like about Zoom is that you don't need to wait until the end of the lecture to ask your question, um, that you can type them as they come to you and then they're just there waiting for Alexandra when she is done with her lecture. Um, and so with that, I will introduce our speaker um, tonight, Alexandra Lowe. It has her PhD in American history from Brandeis University. Um, she's the assistant editor of a six volume annotated works of Henry George that was published by Farley Dickinson University Press and is the co-founder and vice president of an e-commerce site um, for a Cleveland teaching materials called Lecture Source. Um, as you can see from her window, she's clearly not in Ohio. She is out in California where she is joining us this evening. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Alexandra to, to, get, to take it away and to give this Thanks. lecture. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, also, thank you to Mike Barron with the League of Women Voters and um, Case Western Reserve University and the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program for hosting this event. Um, I thought I'd actually start by giving you just sort of a brief overview of kind of everything I plan to talk about. So I'm going to use the screen share function here. Um, and share my PowerPoint with you. Hopefully I've done this correctly. Someone will tell me if I did not. Um, so I've titled my talk, City Upon the Hill, The Influence of Henry George on Progressive Urban Reform. And um, I'm going to start by giving you just a bit of background on Henry George's life um, and really in particular the economic and the social conditions um, in California in the 1870s, because that's really when he formulated um, the ideas that would make him famous. Um, next, I'm going to turn and give you a brief um, overview of the evolution of the city in American life and how by 1890 um, cities had really become sort of breeding grounds for social and economic reformers, really the progressives um, really started in the cities. Um, next, I'm gonna compare the experiences of Hazen Pingree, um, who was mayor of Detroit and Tom Johnson, who I'm sure many of you know, was mayor of Cleveland from 1901 to 1902, or 1901, uh, 1901 to 1909. Um, and what I'm gonna focus on really um, for both of them is how each of them drew upon Henry George's ideas um, in order to support their efforts to have a city run traction system, a streetcar system, and also um, in their efforts to reform property taxation in their respective cities. And I do think Pingree and Johnson are representative of other progressive era, era mayors, um, both in the sort of types of problems they faced and the scale of those problems. I mean, Detroit and Cleveland were both um, sizable and successful in you know, urban areas at this time. Um, but also about the way in the ways that they pulled from Henry George's ideas about land, right, of all things. Um, and I'll, I'll make that connection for you, but why they were pulling from land about ideas about land in order to support urban reform. And then hopefully I get through all of this with plenty of time for questions and maybe even some discussion. I'm sure some of you 
um, know more about Cleveland history than I do and, and particularly um, the formidable Tom Johnson. So um, I'm actually gonna start by addressing the question I think really every good scholar should um, tackle and that is the sort of significance and the relevance of their work. And um, so why is it important to learn about Henry George, about his ideas and about their, his, their influence on progressive era um, mayors? Now, the answer I think um, is that it's important because there are a lot of similarities, right? In the era in which George kind of formulated his fundamental truth um, and the world we actually live in today, um, politically and economically. Um, and more important, I think the process by which George and through him, others came to embrace and apply his ideas, it demonstrates the power of original thinking, right? Thinking that actually challenges the status quo, the way of always doing things, um, you know, in pursuit of a greater cause. George didn't go to college. Um, he was not a rich man. He wasn't even very well connected. But his ideas exerted a tremendous amount um, of impact on people from all different walks of life, right? On rich men, um, like, like both Johnson and Pingree were. On religious men, there was a very famous New York priest um, named Father McGlynn who, who celebrated his ideas. On statesmen like Woodrow Wilson and Joseph Chamberlain in Great Britain. And even on intellectuals like John Dewey and Albert Einstein. Now, there's very little in Henry George's early life or upbringing to really suggest that he was going to write a top selling book on political economy of all time. Um, he was born in Philadelphia on September 2nd, 1839. He was the second of 10 children and the eldest son of Richard and Catherine George. His father, Richard, um, worked at the customs house as a clerk in Philadelphia and the family lived modestly. Um, Henry George left school at age 13. He tended to work odd jobs and then he eventually learned how to set type. And then at age 16, he sailed to Australia and India as a ship hand. And when he got back, he found work as a typesetter um, for a big publishing house called King and Baird. Now that um, publishing house closed in the aftermath of the Panic of 1857. So Henry George, who's then uh, 18, um, he decides to head west. And like other men of his generation, he sailed to California in search of gold. Um, and like most young men of his generation, he didn't find any gold. Um, he spent 1858 sort of in and out of various uh, mining camp camps on the Western uh, seaboard. In 1859, he settled in San Francisco and found work as a compositor. In 1861, he met and he married uh, Anna Corsina Fox and in 1862, they welcomed a son, Henry George Jr. Now George's employment throughout the 1860s was, was very sporadic and it was actually pretty low paying. And um, after a particularly desperate time, um, it was, this was after the birth of his second son, Richard, um, he decided he needed a new career and he moved into journalism. He started submitting editorials to James McClatchy of the Sacramento Bee on, on really a wide variety of topics. Now, it wasn't until 1868 that Henry George publishes what I would consider really his first great essay. And uh, he, that's the, the title of that is What the Railroad Will Bring Us. And it was published in um, the Overland Monthly. Now, really more than anything he had produced up until that time, um, What the Railroad Will Bring Us sort of foreshadowed George's interest in um, the issues of the distribution of wealth and economic resources. So while many of his contemporaries at this time were celebrating the massive um, technological development that the first and um, almost completed transcontinental railroad symbolized, George speculated that the benefits of this impressive feat um, would not be shared equally. The truth is that the completion of the railroad and the great consequent increase of business and population, George wrote, will not be a benefit to all of us but only to a portion. Those who have lands, mines, established businesses, certain abilities of, of special abilities of certain kinds, they will become richer for it and find increased opportunity. Those who have only their own labor will become poorer and find it harder to get ahead. Now, one thing that it's important to note about Henry George is that although he wasn't um, a religious man or, or I should say he wasn't a church goer, 
um, particularly in his adult life. He actually was quite spiritual and he really interpreted the world around him in spiritual terms. He made sense of the world in spiritual terms. So he often described formative visions or formative experiences he had as sort of spiritual visions. Now, one such vision came to him while he was riding his um, horse in the Oakland foothills that overlooks San Francisco Bay. And this was in early 1870. And he stopped and uh, he asked a passerby, you know, what land was worth in the area? And the man said, I don't know exactly, but there is someone who will sell some land for $1,000 an acre. And George was shocked at the price. And you have to remember $1,000 in 1870 is, is probably the equivalent of about $20,000 today. So George had an epiphany. With the growth of population, land grows in value and the men who work it must pay more for the privilege. In 1870, the population of California was around half a million people. And again, this was looked upon most of Georgia's contemporaries as a symbol of progress, of development. Um, but the state's growing population also served to highlight the concentration of land ownership um, in the state. So in 1870, the board of, uh, State Board of Equalization reported that in the 11 most populous counties of the state, only 100 individuals controlled about 5.4 million acres of land. And 5.4 million acres of land is about the size of New Jersey. So that's a lot of land. Now, also in 1870, the uh, investment firm, J. Cook and Company, decided they would assume the responsibility for financing another transcontinental railroad. Um, this one was gonna be a Northern route. And to complete the construction of this railroad, they had to, they had to sell $100 million worth of bonds. Now, at first, the bonds sold pretty well, right? Investors lined up to claim a share of the profit the railroad was destined to make. Um, largely from land sales, because at the time, the federal and state governments, um, it was sort of, this was sort of the standard practice, they would gift railroad corporations enormous sections of public land um, on which to lay the track, but also which to help finance by selling to help finance construction. Now, by 1872, for several different reasons, Cook found it harder to find any investors. And in an act of desperation, he poured large amounts of his own money um, into the railroad. And on September 18th, 1873, he had to declare bankruptcy. Now the collapse of Jay Cook's investment firm triggered a string of closures around the country. Investment of all kind came to an abrupt halt. Um, the Bank of California was really hit hard and by 1875, it had to close. The Panic of 1873 ushered in what later became known as the Long Depression of the 1870s. And at the time, this was the worst economic disaster the nation had ever experienced. And to make things worse, a below average snowfall in the winter of 1876 and 1877 in California meant that streams that were really essential for irrigation had started to dry up and agricultural workers joined the ranks of the unemployed. Tensions brewed in San Francisco where unemployment reached 25%. So this climate was ripe for a rabble rousing demagogue who described, uh, who's disguised himself, I should say, as a working class populist to take the stage. And his name was Dennis Carney. Throughout the summer of 1877, Carney held rallies in the vacant sand lots outside of San Francisco. Um, these were known at the time as the sand lot riots. And he and his followers uh, formed a political party, the Working Men's Party of California. And they denounced the state's capitalists and the wealthy, quote, Knob Hill elites. Um, Knob Hill is a, is a wealthy neighborhood in San Francisco. And they accused them of destroying families and the livelihoods of the white working class by hiring, quote, parasites from China. Now, while Carney and his other, and the other leaders of the Working Men's Party um, did actually call for reasonable demands, um, including you know, the taxation of monopoly profits, the formation of a commission to regulate railroads. Um, history has tended to remember Carney and his followers as virulent racists who were largely responsible for the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Acts. Um, and that's not an inaccurate way to remember a man who ended every public speech with the slogan, the Chinese must, must go. But it is useful to take a look for a moment 
at some of his other um, remarks. So in an 1878 address, Carney called out, quote, the money men who have, quote, seized upon the government by bribery and corruption, made speculation and public robbery a science, stolen the public land, and by their unprincipled greed brought a crisis of unparalleled distress upon 40 millions of people. And this, he's talking, of course, of the um, panic of 1873 and the Long Depression. Now, Henry George attended working men's party rallies. And for a short while, he was actually the party's nominee to serve as a delegate to the um, 1878 uh, California Constitutional Convention. Um, but I think probably fortunately for George, um, the party revoked his nomination after he refused to serve on the same platform as Carney at a rally. The Working Men's Party succeeded in getting many of its demands included in the new California Constitution, um, which was adopted in 1879. Um, Carney earned significant national victory in 1882 uh, when Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Acts, barring Chinese laborers, both um, skilled laborers and unskilled ones, from entering the United States for at least 10 years. Um, those acts were renewed for another 10 years in 1892, and then they were made permanent in 1902. And the Chinese Exclusion Acts weren't repealed until 1943. Now, I kind of always like this, um, this cartoon. It appeared in um, a magazine called Wasp in 1878. And um, the editors of the, of the magazine didn't want to print Carney's picture um, in anything that they, they printed about um, his rallies. And so they used a face of a donkey or a jackass, if you will. Um, and he's saying the Chinese must go. And then the editors are asking, but, but who is it that's keeping them? And you kind of see from the vignettes in the background um, that it's, it, it's the white people of California who keep the Chinese businesses alive, you know, by getting their laundry done or buying cigars. Um, so anyway, so at the height of popularity of, of Carney's popularity and the Working Men's Party, George decided to start writing his, really his magnus opus and um, the work that really would, would define him. And uh, that was called Progress and Poverty. Um, and some have said, I, I have a hard time actually verifying this statistic, um, but it's been cited several places that Progress and Poverty was the top selling um, book in the 19th century um, except for the Bible. The Bible was the only thing that sold more copies <clears throat> in, all, in the, all of the 19th century. Um, now, Progress and Poverty is 500 pages or so, <laughs> um, but it only took George two years to write. Um, and by this point, George had lived in California for new, nearly two decades, right? So he'd observed and he had experienced the problems that to him seemed to continu continuously plague um, industrial capitalist societies, right? These are financial panic, unemployment, low wages, poverty. And so he thought he understood the causes. And now in 1877, when he started writing, he believed he had the solution. Um, it wasn't Chinese exclusion. So like I said, progress in poverty is, is long, but it's good. <laughs> and I'm just going to very, very briefly summarize it for you. Um, George begins by stating the sort of problem, the central problem that he hopes to, to address. And that is the fact that over the past century, human civilization had witnessed unprecedented levels of technological development um, in industrial production, right? New sources of power, improved methods of transportation really enabled mankind to produce and distribute more goods than ever before. Despite the fact that society could produce exponentially more food, families continued to starve, right? Despite the fact that the nation's leading industrialists earned more profit than at any other time in history, workers continued to struggle to support their families. And despite the fact that America's economy was larger and more diversified than it had ever before been, the nation continued to face periodic financial panic and industrial depression. Why? Well, the answer to George was land, right? Land, the resource that from the time of its creation had really existed for the benefit of all mankind was monopolized, 
It was hoarded by people, the wealthy who charged exorbitant prices for really other people to use and improve upon it. And then those owners reap the benefit in the form of the work of the people that were working the land um, in the form of rent. So George believed that every single person had an equal right to the use of land, right? As he, as he says, it's, it's their equal right to breathe the air, right? It is a right proclaimed by the fact of their existence. So then what is the solution to this? If everybody has, has the right to use a portion of the earth, but nobody actually has, you know, very few people are able to utilize that right, you know, what do we do about it? How do we correct this? So the remedy to George is to replace all taxes with one single tax on the value of land. Um, George didn't like any ta other taxes, you know, taxes on labor, um, taxes on imports, anything like that. He thought discouraged uh, production, it discouraged productivity, right? But a single tax on the value of land um, would only reach those that really had the ability to pay without punishing those who really only had their labor um, to earn wealth from. So he wanted to tax this value and, and land values is a form of rent, right? Of economic rent. Um, and he wanted to redistribute those values back into the community, which, which really helped create that value. Because, you know, unlike, other, unlike the value of other types of property, right? The value of land doesn't increase because let's say you put a house on the land, right? Or you even put a farm on the land. Um, it, it increases because of the surrounding community. Um, so like other economists before him, George recognized the indisputable truth that the value of land was different from the value of other types of property, right? So think for a moment, why it is that real estate prices are so much higher, say in Manhattan, than they are in Omaha, right? One is a bustling center, center of civilization and the other is probably a very nice place to live. But the point is that there's really nothing fundamentally different about the land um, in you know, New York versus Nebraska, right? The difference is in the communities that populate that land. So by taxing only land values, George believed this would produce ever greater levels of opportunity because it would strengthen man's right to the use of nature and his desire for productive life. And to George, land really included everything um, supplied freely by nature. So include, that included water, that included minerals, that included anything, the surface of the earth, but everything underneath it as well. And taxing only land values, George believed, um, would eliminate um, the financial panics, like the one in 1873, which he saw as being caused by these sort of continuously bursting bubbles of land speculation. Taxing only land values, George believed, was not just the application of sound public policy, but it really was a fulfillment of a spiritual duty. So George's uh, solution, right, his remedy became known as a single tax, and people who supported it were called single taxers. The inherent fairness, I think, and simplicity of this solution drew people to the um, ideas of Henry George from all over the world and from all different walks of life. And I could spend a considerable amount of time going over the very diverse and impressive list of figures and movements who you can trace um, sort of inspiration um, from, from Henry George and his single tax. Um, but you know, I still need to get to the, the sort of the meat of my talk. And so I just wanna say um, that for a short while in the 1880s, so this is after Progress and Poverty is published, um, George was actually the most talked about man in England. Um, and then in 1886, he moved to New York City and he was nominated to serve as the United Labor Party nominee for mayor of New York City. And he lost the election, not by much, um, but he famously earned more votes um, than the Republican candidate and future president, Teddy Roosevelt, um, who placed third in that, in that 1886 contest. So George died in 1897, um, actually at the height of a, of a second campaign for mayor of New York City. And, uh, but his death didn't signal the end of his ideas um, or his influence. And um, for a variety of reasons, and I'm gonna talk about this now, um, the city, right, 
urban areas really offered the ideal setting to put George's ideas about land and land values um, into action. So let's talk a little bit about cities. Um, really few institutions, I think, in American culture have experienced that kind of profound change um, throughout the 19th century than really the city did. And it's kind of hard to imagine in our highly urbanized world today um, that the city and its role as a sort of fixture in American life is actually relatively recent. Um, in the colonial era, cities and towns were established really just out of necessity. Um, they protected settlers at the time from the dangers and uncertainties of the new world. And as one historian put it, they served as sort of instruments of control. But by the turn of the 20th century, cities had become really the prime agents of industrial progress, the vital organs of America's cultural um, and economic body. And the evolution of a city from a necessary evil into a fixture of American life, um, like most things in the 19th century, um, is really tied to this, the nation's story of economic transformation, right? How it goes from being this sort of colonial outpost into the world's largest economy. So to give you some statistics here, in 1820, only 7% of the US population lived in an urban area of at least 2,500 people. By 1870, the number had increased by 25, up to 25%. And by 1890, um, a little more than a third of the nation's population now lived in an urban area. So cities were adding more people at this time, but they were also starting to specialize in one or two major industries. So for Chicago, um, it was wholesale slaughtering and meat packing. <clears throat> for St. Louis, it was tobacco products. Um, and with this trend towards industrial specialization came um, just immense interdependence, right? So imagine the extent to which the, the civic vitality um, of these turn of the century cities really depended on the performance of a primary industry. So even minor economic vacillations that caused the closing of a single plant um, would be drastically felt throughout the entire city. So cities are becoming more populated, they're becoming more specialized, they're more interdependent. Um, and by the turn of the 20th century, they're also really just grossly mismanaged. Um, and there's a few reasons for that, I think. Um, throughout the 18th and most of the 19th century, cities really lacked um, the most basic self-governing powers, right? This includes the power to raise revenue. Right. Cities could not sell bonds, they could not levy taxes, they could not contract debt. So to finance any kind of public worker services, cities really had to rely on disbursements from the state or the cooperation of landowners in the city who would agree to adopt a sort of temporary special assessment on their property. So lacking the authority or revenue um, to provide much needed services to a growing population, city leaders started to appeal to so-called um, party bosses, right? The sort of Tammany Hall um, party machine bosses. So these men were well-connected, they were even better funded and they could help them gain the sort of necessary authorization from the state to finance improvements and services within their cities. But in exchange for their help, right? Party bosses demanded valuable contracts, um, sinecures for their wide network of lackeys, um, and valuable public franchises. And this standard of, of city government really prevailed for most of the 19th century. But beginning in the 1890s, we start to see change. Um, really fed up with the kind of growing corruption and ineptitude of city management, um, a new breed of social and political reformer began to speak out. Um, now, some of them spoke out through publication of journalistic exposés, right? We've all heard of the muckrakers of this time and others um, spoke out through the use of social scientific surveys and studies to um, sort of support their calls for reform. And together, these groups of people um, made up the progressives. Now, progressives at this time lacked a common political party. Um, they, they came from both, part, mo both of the major parties, Democrats and Republican. Um, and they didn't really even have a standard background, although I think we would probably consider most part of the sort of you know, middle class. Um, 
But what they did do is what they did have in common is that they, they all drew from a sort of a set of ideas, a pool of ideas um, that challenged, I think, laissez-faire attitudes about government. Um, and they really recognized that there was an expanded role for the government to play as a, as a positive agent in social and economic development. Now, central to this pool of ideas that these progressives were drawing from was this idea that not everything belonged in the private market, right? So just as nearly every facet of American life is becoming more commercialized, more commodified, progressives start to fight to keep some fundamental services and resources out of the marketplace. These tended to be resources um, for which, you know, the social costs were deemed too high to allow private market forces to control. So for some, these resources included education, healthcare, child labor, and for others, they included natural monopolies, things like water, gas, electricity, and transportation. Industries in which it really was most efficient to have just one supplier in the city, and industries that are based largely on land. So at the city level, the fight to transfer the delivery of essential services from private to public providers was called municipalization. And like George's single tax, which attempted to reclaim and redistribute the socially created value of land, municipalization targeted the socially generated profits of public service monopolists. But municipalization of public utilities and services required a larger degree of local autonomy than most American cities enjoyed in 1890. So while they were fighting for municipalization and even tax reform, Hayes and Pingree in Detroit and Tom Johnson in Cleveland also had to fight for measures designed to increase cities, cities' governing power vis-a-vis -vis the state in local affairs. So these measures that they were fighting for included the initiative, the referendum, and also home rule, which is essentially the authority of the city government to levy taxes without interference from state lawmakers. When Hayes and Pingree was first elected mayor of Detroit in 1889, 1889 rather, he wasn't really an outspoken champion of municipalization um, or the single tax. But after a, a nearly 10 year war really against Detroit's street railway companies, um, he generally became an advocate of both. And I think the reason for this evolution lies in the fact that the traction issue especially illustrated the oppressive nature of monopolies based in land. So streetcar companies, by the very nature of the service they were providing, controlled large, large portions of the most valuable sections of urban land, right, the streets. Um, and we may think of railroads as like the vehicle for carrying both freight and passengers on long distance trips. Um, but in the early, you know, the late 19th century, the early 20th century, the primary experience of most people had with railroads was really in the form of urban uh, streetcars. And really nowhere in, I would say, to the turn of the century American city um, was the sort of imbalance between private market forces and where the public wanted to go, the direction the public wanted to take um, clearer than it had been in traction politics. And I think we should, we should consider for a moment what streetcars really represented to people at this time. So they were the city dwellers automobile before there were automobiles. Um, streetcars determined the opportunities, but also the limitations of a city's spatial growth. Um, and they were the factory worker or the wage workers means of escape um, when they had a day off. So streetcars were really potentially everyone's utility. What's more is the profits and the monopoly position of streetcar companies was almost wholly dependent on the city. Right? The city was responsible for granting franchises for right-of-way access to public streets. Now, Tom Johnson understood this truth firsthand as a successful streetcar monopolist. Pingree, however, had to learn it sort of on the job through his fight with Detroit streetcar companies um, to achieve better service and lower fares for, for his residents. Now, both mayors utilized George's ideas to bring the private streetcar companies really to their knees. And it makes sense because on the one hand, you have Georgia's single tax, which attempted to reclaim and publicly distribute socially created value of land, right? Land values. And on the other hand, municipalization of streetcars, 
or really any public service industry sought to reclaim and publicly distribute the profits of a private corporation that were gained through monopolies in, pu in public franchises. So in progressive era Detroit and Cleveland, um, the streetcar industry was, was dominated by one or at most two um, corporations. Now, ironically, during Pingree's tenure as mayor of Detroit, Johnson actually managed one of the two main um, corporations, streetcar corporations. Um, and Johnson actually fought Pingree tooth and nail, um, you know, as Pingree attempted to sort of reclaim the streetcar system for the city. What is less ironic is how Johnson then ended up pursuing a lot of the same tactics that Pingree had utilized against him when he became mayor of Cleveland a decade later. And he also decided to take on the private streetcar um, monopolies. Now, so Pingree and Johnson, they're mayors of separate cities and, and, and they're separated you know, by about a decade. Um, but I, I'm gonna kind of tell their stories um, with regards to how they fought the streetcar companies um, sort of together because they're very, very similar. And, and as I mentioned before, <clears throat> Johnson was really part of um, the story in Detroit. So I've already mentioned that um, when Pingree and Johnson were mayors, um, neither Detroit nor Cleveland had home rule, right? So neither, neither uh, mayor had the ability to just say, um, we're going to purchase the streetcar system from these private companies and operate it for the citizens. That wasn't an option. But they still had other weapons to use to sort of you know, help correct the sort of gross imbalance that existed between what was the public's interest and the private control over the city's transportation network. And one of those tools was um, the veto power over franchise renewals. So first Pingree and then also later Johnson um, frequently vetoed franchise renewals that didn't meet certain requirements. So in Detroit, um, one of those requirements um, when Pingree became mayor was a three cent fare, streetcar fare during working hours. Um, the going rate for streetcar fares was something like five cents per ride plus additional fees for transfers. Um, but Pingree came in as mayor of Detroit, he decided he was not going to sign any new, um, any renewals of franchises unless the streetcar companies agreed to meet this three cent fare. Um, so the other thing that Pingree also mandated as part of his, um, you know, his, in order to get his signature on these franchise renewals was, was also modernization of the streetcar system because um, Detroit at the time was actually, was actually a, an exception really to what was going on elsewhere, which was the electrification of, of streetcars. So you can kind of see in this photo here, I don't actually think this is Detroit, but this is an example of a horsepowered streetcar, which um, when, when Pingree became mayor of Detroit, almost all of the main and the suburban lines were powered by horse. So in his very first veto message of a franchise renewal, um, and Pingree vetoed many, um, he made the following observation about public franchises. He said, you know, private ownership of natural monopolies in cities is necessarily the cause of immense financial loss to city to citizens. The city's valuable franchises are property, as much so as the money of the city. They are rated by taxation in the city's treasury. And in my opinion, no property of the city should be given away. So, so Pingree really sees these, these franchises, uh, public franchises as, as public property. Um, they were also a lot like land. Right? So the value of public franchises increased um, really because the community around it, the city itself, um, started to increase and grow and develop. And Pingree said as much during his second term as mayor um, after streetcar companies said, you know, there's just no way we could turn a profit um, by charging only three cents um, per ride. And, and then Pingree says in his veto message, um, the street railway monopoly may be fixed at a rate that may seem fair today, but in 10 years from now, through the growth of the city, the same privilege will exceed the present value by millions. Now to whom should this great enhancement be credited and made useful, if not to the entire people who have added this growth and value? The most frequently used and powerful weapons in the arsenal of streetcar companies um, to sort of combat 
these um, efforts by Pingree and later Johnson to, to take over the streetcar system were injunctions and lawsuits. So every time city councils passed and the mayor signed a new requirement for a franchise renewal, um, the companies, the private companies took them to court. And although these lawsuits often failed, um, they had the impact of delaying any progress towards a reduction in streetcar fares. But as more existing franchises began to expire, Pingree and then later Johnson and Cleveland um, would, would be able to award these franchise, new franchises to companies um, which promised to meet the three cent fair requirement. Um, but oftentimes these new lines that were granted franchises to operate a three cent car fare, um, they didn't have all the capital up front really to begin immediate operation. And so the private streetcar monopolies would pressure their friends in the financing world um, to withhold investment in the new three cent lines. Um, and sometimes they would even pay property owners within the city to withhold their consent, which was required at the time, um, for any of the new lines to be built. But Pingree and Johnson also found ways around these delay tactics. So in Detroit, um, Pingree spearheaded a boycott and again, this is kind of ironic. Um, it was against Johnson's private line. Um, and in Cleveland, Johnson actually organized a whole fundraising campaign um, to help a uh, newly awarded three cent company, a new franchise for a three cent company to uh, secure the necessary capital it needed to begin operation. So as the reality that of a three cent car fare line became more certain, streetcar companies decided they would come to the bargaining table, start working with the mayors. I and mean, that really is really what Pingree and later Johnson had hoped for. So towards the end of his fourth and final term as mayor, um, Pingree developed another weapon to use against streetcar companies. Um, and he actually enlisted Johnson to help him. So in his 1911 memoir, Johnson recalled that by about 1895, um, he was tired of the streetcar business. Um, he was ready to move on. Um, he had recently sold his uh, railway interest in Cleveland and he was about, he was ready to do the same in Detroit. So Pingree knew this and so he approached Johnson and he asked for his help working out a solution for Detroit whereby the new three cent line would, would be able to continue operation basically for, for a long time, right? That it wouldn't eventually become absorbed by an existing private corporation that was better funded, um, right? That it would outlast, I guess, essentially his tenure as mayor. And, and Johnson just delivered the hard truth to Pingree and said, look, you know, there's really nothing short of municipal ownership that can prevent the eventual absorption of this three cent line or of a two cent line or of a one cent line if it got down to that level, eventually by a bigger, better funded corporation who would gobble up all the street franchises, public franchises, and then raise rates. And Johnson, you know, recalling this, this conversation with, with Pingree wrote that, you know, I believe in municipal ownership of all public service monopolies for the same reason I believe in municipal ownership of waterworks, of parks, of schools. I believe the municipal ownership of these monopolies because if you do not own them, they will in time own you. They will rule your politics, corrupt your institutions and finally destroy your liberties. So Pingree with Johnson's help worked at a plan whereby the city of Detroit could sort of virtually acquire the traction system without actually acquiring it. Pingree urged the council to authorize the formation of an independent commission and then empower this commission to lease all property um, of the private streetcar companies. And the private streetcar companies at this, at this juncture had agreed to lease all of their property to this new independent commission. And that's exactly what happened in Detroit and, for, and in Cleveland. Um, unfortunately, this sort of virtual municipal ownership um, didn't last long in either city. The private streetcar companies insisted on extremely high valuations of their stock. Um, and then in the case of, of Ohio, a judge later determined that the people of Cleveland really had a right to vote on the charter of this new independent commission that was going to run the streetcar systems. And by the time all of these lawsuits were settled and the state had passed the necessary legislation that actually allowed cities to um, you know, own and operate the streetcar systems even without these independent commissions. Well, Henry Ford introduced his Model T and soon after cars 
reduce the demand for streetcars, so personal automobiles, that is. But municipalization really wasn't the only front on which Pingree and later Johnson um, waged war against the streetcar companies. They also fought them on the issue of taxation. And again, they drew from Henry George's ideas in order to do this. Um, and they achieved far greater success. So railroad companies, uh, like other land-based public service corporations, um, were privy to all sorts of property tax exemptions. Um, and you have to remember that at this time, most states, uh, in most states, the property tax, the general property tax that is, was really the, was really the only source of revenue for local governments. Um, it's also the oldest source of revenue for local governments. But that system of general property taxation in Michigan and Ohio and throughout much of the, the nation um, really suffered, continues to suffer um, from inequities in design. Um, local and state governments had implemented the general property tax um, largely because they believed it offered the fairest way to distribute the tax burden um, in proportion to total wealth. And, and they weren't wrong about that. The problem is that property included a wide range of both tangible and intangible assets, right? So it included buildings, livestock, furniture, jewelry, um, machinery, stocks, bonds. And from the outset, uh, tax appraisers faced tremendous difficulties gathering accurate accounts of what things were worth. And so they often had to rely on the values provided by the individual or corporate property owner. Now, this may come to a sh as a shock to you, but property owners did not always tell the truth. Um, in fact, a historian uh, by the name C.K. Yearly, one, Yearly once wrote that um, before the enactment of prohibition, probably nothing in American life entailed more calculated, premeditated lying than the general property tax. Now, the property tax also had provoked fears in the South when it was first introduced that it could be used as a political tool to discourage the ownership of certain types of property, right, namely slaves. So in reaction to this fear, state legislatures adopted what were known as uniformity clauses into their constitutions that mandated the same rate of taxation on all types of property. But as we know, not all types of property are indicative of one's overall, overall wealth or potential for wealth, um, nor are certain types of property subject to the same sort of unearned increase that land and natural resources or public franchises are. And in the mid 19th century, um, a lot of states started offering special tax exemptions to railway companies in particular in order to promote um, development so that they would build faster. In Michigan, in lieu of a payment of a property tax, railroad companies were instead charged a measly 1.5% tax on their gross earnings. Now, Hayes and Pingree didn't run for re-election as mayor of Detroit in 1897. Instead, he ran for governor, and he actually won. And upon taking office, one of the first things he did was to call a special session of the legislature to address the issue of taxation. And at the special session, Pingree pointed out that in 1895, railroad, railroad companies paid less than one-tenth of the percentage paid by other taxpayers in the state. In some cases, it was far less. These companies, Pingree pointed out, had property valued at millions of dollars and yet paid barely over $1,000 in taxes per year. A better taxation system, Pingree argued, would not only remove the special assessments on railroads, but increase taxes on the real estate owned by these companies and lowering them uh, or, or removing taxes altogether on any kind of goods or capital um, improvements, which were also considered property at that time. And sounding, I think, very Henry George-like, um, Pingree explained, taxation of the products of labor tends to discourage production of wealth and to reduce wages. It is like drying up the source of a stream. On the other hand, the taxation of real estate especially that for held for speculation is a benefit to industry of all kinds or all forms. But as a result of the uniformity clauses in Michigan, Pingree knew that he would likely never win an effort to increase the rate of taxation on land only. So Pingree pushed for a measure that would remove those kind of exemptions and the special assessments on um, gross income from railroads 
and subject all corporate property, especially railroad property, to an ad valorem tax, which is, which is a tax on the value of the property. Um, the Michigan Supreme Court ruled, though, in 1898, that any changes to the system of taxation for railroad property really had to be approved um, by a constitutional amendment. So Pingree had one drafted, and then to generate the voter support for that amendment, um, he created an independent state tax commission to publish a thorough assessment of all corporate property tax rates so that the public could see in no uncertain terms the privileges afforded to the railroad companies in the form of tax relief. In 1899, the people of Michigan voted by a margin of eight to one to increase the rate of taxation on railway property. And Johnson similarly achieved more favorable results on um, the taxation front of this sort of traction war. Um, unlike Michigan, however, his efforts didn't require a constitutional amendment. In fact, the Ohio constitution already required the appraisal of all property, personal or corporate, at its full market value. Now the problem was that in many places, assessors never appraised property for taxation purposes anywhere near the full market value. Railroad property in particular was only taxed at about 14 to 24% of its actual value. Now, now Johnson, by the time he took office was an avid single taxer. And, and one of his first um, actions as, as mayor of Cleveland was to tax or it was sorry, it was to organize a tax school. And he appointed two local personalities to lead it. One was a lawyer who, um, who actually eventually became mayor um, named Newton Baker. And then the other was a local union leader named Peter Witt. And he ordered Baker and Witt to produce a large map of all the assessed property values in Cleveland. And then he um, ordered them to hold a series of public meetings to determine what he called the real value of one foot of land by 100 feet in depth. Um, and this method of calculating property value was called the summer system um, and was based on the idea that the value of any plot of land in any area, rural or urban, could be expressed through a sort of mathematical formula that considered the average unit of value and then the factors that increased that value, proximity to businesses or transportation. And this quote here that I've included by um, from W.A. Summers, who's the architect of the summer system of real estate valuation, I just think is, is kind of funny because to ascertain the value of anything, ask anyone who knows, his answer will be what he thinks it worth based upon his thinking that he knows what others think it worth. It kind of is the sort of the sense that things are worth what other people think they're worth, right? Or what other people would pay for them. So the tax school that Johnson created um, published its findings. Um, and then the County Board of Equalizers met um, and they voted to increase property appraisals of Cleveland, of all Cleveland public service companies by 450% based on the findings of this tax school. Now, unsurprisingly, these corporations appealed that decision. Um, and then at a special hearing before the Ohio Board of Tax Remissions, representatives of the corporations argued that that decision by the Board of Equalizers um, really amounted to confiscation of their private property. So that state board gave public service corporations a temporary reprieve and they, they overturned the decision. Um, but armed with this data from the tax school that he created, Johnson continued to fight for more accurate appraisals on uh, railroad property and other the property of other public service corporations. And little by little, he got closer to them. So between 1900 and 1904, really as a, as a result of more accurate appraisals, Cleveland added about $60,000 per year in revenue, which I know doesn't sound like much, but again, you know, 60,000 in, in 1900, I think is the equivalent of $1.7 million today. Um, and I think maybe I've been talking for almost an hour. It's a good time to sort of stop and hopefully um, take some questions and field some you know discussion. Um, I kind of wanted to end, on this note, because we have a little success um, for Johnson and he had other successes as well, as you probably know, but um, this is just the one that I was talking about for this talk here. So thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Absolutely, that was great. Oh my gosh, there's so much information in there. That was fantastic. Uh, there are a good number of questions that are coming in. 
Um, first one early on um, from Marty was about Kearney. And do you, do you know if there's any connection with Kearney, New Jersey? Is that named after him? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I think it's pronounced Kearney. I could be wrong. Kearney. Oh, sorry. sorry. Irish. Um, he he wasn't he is an immigrant, but I think he came straight to almost straight to the West Coast from from Ireland. He was a relatively recent immigrant as well, which is sort of ironic that he was so anti Chinese immigration. But yeah. there you have it. Um, I don't know of any connection. No. All right. Um, another question: Are land taxes being used today, and have they worked as expected? Well, most of our you know most places the property tax. Uh, includes that you pay every year includes partially it's on land and partially it's on the sort of value of your of your home they don't usually separate those assessments they're kind of continued in but yeah no there's lots of places where they they do separate them and they have actually increased the rates um, on land as opposed to you know the sort of the, the house value and things like that um, there's places in Pennsylvania where they've where they're doing that um, Pittsburgh I think you know experimented with it um, there's someone named Josh Vincent, who's kind of a, a, a sort of an expert on this, and he's trying to get local um, governments to adopt a sort of better uh, Henry George-like uh, taxation system. And, and he would actually be the person you would, you would he would know everywhere in the United States where this is being done. Um, he has a uh, organization called, I think it's the Center for, um, oh, shoot, now I'm not remembering the title of it. So that probably someone in the audience knows. <laughs> But his name is Josh Vincent, if you look him up, and he'll tell you every single place probably in the United States that is doing it. Nice. Um, where did Tom L. Johnson and Henry George differ in terms of their policy beliefs? Hmm. Well, hmm. Well, I think probably just in the fact that Johnson wasn't a purist, and he really couldn't be. Um, you know, George never actually did hold public office. He ran for mayor twice, and he died the you know the second time he was running, and he lost the first time, and then he never really held public office again. So he could, from the sort of grandstands, continue to be this purist and accept nothing short of a full you know tax on the value of land. But you know, Johnson had to accept. That that, that that wasn't really gonna happen you know, because of constitutional restrictions, because of uniformity clauses. So he compromised a lot more um, than I think probably Henry George would. But you know, when, when Johnson was in Congress, so he served two terms in Congress before he became mayor of Detroit, or mayor of Cleveland rather, he, went, you know, he promoted Henry George's idea, ideas pretty you know, avidly and purely. And one of those ideas was the um, removal of, of the tariff, uh, which was really controversial, has been controversial for, for a long time, but he was an advocate, he was a free trader, even though that position hurt him economically. Um, so there isn't much they differed on, I would say. Mm -hmm. It probably only when it came down to really putting anything in, into, into practice and because yeah. Johnson was actually a, a public official and, and George never was. Mm -hmm. He was just a theorist, yeah. Um, why was Cle why were Cleveland and Detroit so susceptible to progressive mayors, seemingly more so than, say, Chicago or New York? Is that true? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I know of another mayor of, of um, Golden Rule Jones of, in, in Toledo of, in Ohio, but I don't know that that's necessarily true. Um, there probably are lots of other examples. I haven't done, I'm not, I, I wouldn't say I have done a whole lot of research on other ones. I do know of some other progressive era mayors um, and they came, actually I would say mostly in the Midwest, you, you find mm. them. You had more progressive era governors, I would think in some of the, you know, the coastal states. Um, but I don't, I don't know that there's anything in particular about these Midwestern cities that made them so much different and more susceptible to, to progressive mayors, maybe Chicago and New York are slightly older. Um, and so the sort of political um, machines were more entrenched there, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Um, a couple of people have chimed in that Josh, Josh Benson's organization is the Center for the Study of Economics. I knew there was a C and an S and an E, perfect. 
Uh, let's see. Um, another question from the audience. Did Henry George and his followers have any beliefs about public education, especially because of the large numbers of immigrants who are coming into Cleveland and other cities? Sure, yeah. So um, one of Henry George's followers, a woman um, by the name of Marietta Johnson, um, sort of you, and she actually lived in a, um, a sort of a colony that tried to experiment with a single tax in Fairhope, mm -hmm. Alabama, of all places. And in that colony, she kind of utilized Henry George's ideas in a sort of abstract way to um, develop a system of education, which was much more practical and, and hands-on. It was less about book learning and rote learning and that sort of thing. Um, and she was a huge advocate of, you know, free universal education, which most people were at the time, at least for um, elementary school. Um, Henry George himself helped, you know, um, create and found the um, free, you know, public library in San Francisco. So, you know, George was an autodidact. He, he pretty much was self-learned, he self-taught. So um, he wanted to make all of the sort of, you know, knowledge of the world available to everybody. So I would say, even though he wasn't very um, involved personally in any kind of the educational movements, I think it's not, it, it's fair to say he would have supported the, anything that increased access to education and definitely a sort of funding of public education and public educational services from a land value tax, tax would be absolutely he would not support. Another one is, there's so many, we're gonna have to figure okay. out, we're gonna answer all of them. Um, is the modern day offering of tax abatements a form of George's policy? Form of tax abatements and form of George's policy. I'm not sure, is there, can they be a little bit more, more descriptive? Mm. Anything more to that? The, let's For have example, another more example. And we'll go on to the next question. I would say I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Um, what level of adoption did the summer system gain by accessors? Is it still used today? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, that was widely used. Um, uh, summers came from Minneapolis, I want to say. Um, there's a there's a man by the name Bill Bat who who's written quite a bit about the summer system and its its um, use in um, cities throughout the 20, early 20th century. Um, and I'm sure there are definitely cities still today that continuously use the summer system. And I do apologize for not knowing a lot of um, current, <laughs> keeping up on the current you know, state of things. I mean, I, I'll, I will just say that I am a historian. So yeah, historian. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and I have two very young children, which prevents me from reading a lot these days. <laughs> um, you're, okay, is, is it true that farmers loathed, that farmers loathed land taxes? How did George deal with that in what was still largely an agrarian society? Yeah, so at first, yes, um, a lot of farmers opposed George's ideas, thinking that they were going to have to pay a lot more in um, taxation. And in some of this um, confusion was purposeful on, on, um, from George's opponents who would start calling his, they called the single tax the land tax, but it really wasn't a tax on land, it was a tax on land value. So land that didn't have value or had very little value would be taxed very, very little. And actually most of the uh, rural and agrarian land was not, it, it was not really where the single tax would fall the heaviest. It would fall on urban land where that, where the values mm. were the highest. Mm. Um, and so while he did get some pushback from farmers at first, um, a lot of the, the populists actually did end up calling for some type of land value taxation in their, in their platforms. And he did have um, far, it, it sort of, he did gain more, um, farm following, I would say. Um, so Tom L. Johnson made his money as a monopolist, mm -hmm. really become anti-monopolist after meeting and studying Henry George, or was it just a ploy to get elected? <laughs> um, well, he continued, so George told, I mean, according to his memoir, so a lot of this is coming from Johnson himself. You know, his, he wrote this memoir in, called My Story in 1911. Um, and then also from various, you know, other biographies of George that talk about meetings between Johnson and George. Um, for, from his point of view, he was, he was a full supporter of Henry George, but George told him to keep making money because basically the cause was gonna need money. It was gonna need rich people to run for public office and then finance um, various public campaigns. 
Um, and, and Johnson actually was a financier of, of George's mayoral campaign. So although he would say he was against a lot of the things that he, you know, become when he became a public figure, he actually did did distance himself from the his streetcar monopolies when he ran for office. But he did hold on to some other um, profitable uh, businesses. And that was again to sort of continue, as George told him, to keep making money, because money is going to be useful here. Um, but I do think he believed what he was was trying to what he was preaching. I, I do think so. I mean, when he was in Congress, he supported um, the uh, removal of a of a steel tariff that would would have ruined him because he actually manufactured um, a steel rod at the time. So mm -hmm. I, I do think he was one of the sort of honest ones, so to speak. Um, yeah, okay. So great, I'm just so excited. I'm reading all the questions and trying to listen to you. It's, it's everywhere. Um, so this is a question about what killed the single tax that in Detroit, it was the automobile um, but was it the same in Cleveland? Is that what also killed it in Cleveland, trickling down? Um, well, I, I shouldn't have said that the automobile killed the single tax. It kind of killed the effort to have a municipalized streetcar system. Um, no, the single tax always faced an uphill battle, right? Because mm -hmm. of these constitutional amendments against um, that required uniformity in property taxation. Right. So any kind of any any attempt to implement the single tax would have also had to address these uniformity causes, clauses. So instead, what a lot of reformers ended up doing was just trying to increase the appraisal value, right, to actually appraise land for what it was actually worth for taxation purposes. And that did have a lot of success. It had success in Cleveland. It had success in Detroit and elsewhere. Um, what really killed the single tax, if you want to say killed it, is in terms of a sort of nationwide movement to, a, a, you know, um, really supporting it were two things. I think the rise of there was a socialist faction um, that sort of denounced George. And then the other thing was the income tax. Right. So in 1916, we 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 passed a constitutional amendment to to exempt um, taxes on income from the um, apportionment clause. So when you have an income tax, and more people supporting the income tax, fewer people are supporting a tax on land values. Mm -hmm. And George was adamantly against an income tax. And that actually caused a quite a, a big split in the single taxers between those who accepted the income tax because at the time of it was passed was actually um, you know, in proportion much better than it is today in, to overall wealth. Um, but George did not support it because he did not support any kind of tax other than a tax on economic rent, right? On anything that was unearned. And he thought income was, was earned value. Yeah, okay. And actually looking through that, I think that those are the, the questions that a lot of these, the rest are comments and, and that sort of thing, which I can forward to you. It's a lot of interesting. Um, or, or, oh, I have another. Uh, oh, oh yeah. So oh, uh, people can email me as well. <laughs> Oh, yeah, perfect. 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 Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. This was so informed. I have to admit that this was a part of Cleveland history that I did not know very much about at all. And so, oh, wait, looks like we might have one more question, and then I will let you go. Um, is there any evidence that Joseph Fells provided funds to support the campaigns of either um, Pingree or Johnson? I don't think Pingree, but I think Johnson, yes. Um, and there's some books that you can, I'd have to go back and look at my notes, but Fells was, was like Johnson and he bankrolled lots of, of the public campaigns in support of single tax. And there were single tax um, constitutional amendments proposed in Colorado and Oregon in California. Um, you know, funny thing about, I will say that Johnson was successful in promoting the single tax to such a degree that, um, at, at a constitutional convention, I can't remember the year, I want to say 1912 or something around there um, in Ohio, that they actually passed a constitutional amendment that said cities could not levy any kind of anything that came close to a single tax. Wow. So they specifically forbid the sort of enactment of a single tax huh. in Cleveland and in the cities yeah. of Ohio because in large measure because Johnson was so successful in promoting that and getting that across to the people.
All right, thank you so much. This was so great and such a great informative hour to, to learn all about this little little nugget, an important part of, of Cleveland's sure. story. I hope, <laughs> I hope everybody else, sorry, also enjoyed it. <laughs> interested, our next one in this, this series is gonna be on Thursday, December 3rd. Um, so just November, uh, December, I'm sorry, 3rd um, at 7 p.m. as well in a couple of weeks. Um, and that's Women and Philanthropy, the Moneyed Women of Cleveland and Their Impact. So, all right. So thank you so much, Alexandra. Thank you so much for having me and for listening. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Thank everybody for being here. And I hope everybody has a lovely night. So good night. Good night.